In this video, we look at the relationship between media and its audiences in terms of values and the discourses that it presents. One of the key understandings for this VCE area of study is knowing that media texts are products or artifacts of the society in which they're made. No media text is made in a vacuum. They're produced within a social context. And that social context can have an influence on the media text itself and the media text can have an influence on that society. Archaeologists would look at hieroglyphs, pottery and other artifacts to learn about ancient civilizations. Well, we too can look at media texts as forms of artifacts. We can look at films, TV shows and even advertisements in order to teach us about the discourses and the values that were important to a particular culture throughout history. And just when we do it, there's less chance of poison dart injuries. Discourses and social values surrounding a text may influence its making and similarly discourses and social values surrounding an audience may influence... Well, stop. At this point you might be making a face that looks a little bit like this. That's because we're using some terminology here that we're not yet exposed to. So before we can proceed, we need to define three key terms around media texts and society's values. Discourse, social values, and social issues. Now discourse in the media has a number of different definitions from a number of different theorists over the years, but for our purpose, we're gonna define it like this. Discourse in the media is the process of making meaning within a social context. It is the overall discussion around the topic that takes place through the interrelationship between media organizations, media texts, and the audiences within a culture. So it might be easiest to think of discourse in the same way that we think of a discussion. When we look at a discussion, we think about, okay, two people, maybe more, who are talking about a particular topic. Whereas a discourse is like a discussion, but instead of between two or three people, it happens between all members of society. Think of it this way, when we look at a discussion between two people, we can tell if those people are in agreement with one another or not, in terms of the way that they use their body language and their voice and their facial expressions. We can do the same when we look at a discourse by seeing the way in which certain topics are being covered by the media. So here are the key qualities of a discourse that make it easy to identify. A discourse is an abstract concept. A discourse does not change over time or it can extend over a vast period of time unchanging. It's the greater platform on which our social values can form and social issues can arise. And media texts form only part of society's discourse. Other things such as language, laws, politics, education, religion and individual opinions also form part of a discourse. The particular discourse that we're focusing on as part of this media study is homosexuality. Homosexuality as a discourse includes the rights of gay people, their lifestyles and role in society as well as their treatment and acceptance by society at large. We're looking at this discourse in the context of the USA from the 1950s to today. That last little part of our definition of homosexuality as a discourse is really important because whenever we're looking at a discourse, we need to define it and frame it within two really important factors. Time, as well as the culture. Because when we look at different cultures and when we look at different times, we can actually see how the discourse might be the same and yet the society's values may differ greatly. Key term number two. Social values or society's values are those core beliefs and principles that a society holds to be true, valuable or important. And the qualities of a social value is that it can be about individuals, 
groups, institutions, or ideas, not all members of a society may hold the same values. So social values are forever in a state of flux as dominant oppositional and emerging values compete with one another. We'll talk more about the difference between dominant, oppositional and emerging values in a subsequent video in this series. Social values within a society will change and evolve over time and social values at the same time will differ depending on the culture in which they are found. As an example of different cultural values at the same time in history, we need only look at two of Australia's closest neighbours. New Zealand has had marriage equality since 2015, whereas Indonesia has no equal rights for the LGBT community, including marriage. And Australia is in this point in between where there are discrimination laws to protect members of the LGBT community, but we have stalled on the progress of marriage equality. So we sit somewhere between New Zealand's values and Indonesia's values. Another example of the same discourse having very different values within two different cultures at the same time, we can look at the United States and Japan uh, after World War II. In 1941, Japan attacked the USA military base in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. It was the first time that America had been attacked on home soil, and so fear of invasion spread in the USA as a result. This gave rise to the values of protectionism and distrust of foreigners in the USA, particularly Asian foreigners. And then we can see how this actually had an influence on the media texts of the period by looking at some sci-fi films made at that time. Come from another world, spawned in the light years of space, unleashed to take over the bodies and souls of the people of our planet, bringing a new dimension in terror to the giant super scope screen. It's whatever intelligence or instinct it is that can govern the forming of human flesh and blood out of thin air is well, fantastically powerful, beyond any comprehension. The day the Earth stood still, invaders from Mars and invasion of the saucer men all showed uh, aliens arriving through flying saucer and attack cities just like aerial assaults on Pearl Harbor. And when we look at the posters of some of these films, we can actually see themes pop up in terms of the woman being abducted who is white, beautiful, thin, often blonde. And we can also see some similarities in the aliens themselves which was supposed to, in spectacularly racist fashion, mimic some of the trends that Americans saw as being typically Asian of the time in terms of a yellowy greenish skin pigmentation and a slanted eye. But as we know, Japan did not invade the USA. And in fact, there was a very different end to World War II when the USA responded by uh, dropping atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, crippling Japan and ending the World War in 1945. It was a victory based on nothing more than the USA's technological superiority. And so we can actually see within the discourse of technology how the two different cultures of Japan and the USA saw technology in their media texts. In Japan, they didn't fear the invasion of little green men one by one. They had seen the catastrophic effect of one gigantic bomb. And so their fears were based on things like radiation poisoning, which many of its citizens suffered from. And their movies reflected this idea of this great big destructive force that would come in and topple entire cities. Of course, this gave birth to one of Japan's most famous genres, the monster movie, or the kaiju. Meanwhile in the USA, they had put an end to the war because of technology. And therefore, society had the value that technology was a great thing. And this can be seen in some of the texts of the time in the 50s and the 60s, such as the Jetsons, where technology was seen as this great thing and the future looked to be really optimistic and linked to 
the value of technology. So in this example, we can see how at the same point in history, different values can emerge depending on the alternative cultures in which they're presented. But we can also look at this discourse of technology to track how values change over time within the one culture. In the mid 1960s, artificial intelligence was starting to take shape and people were inventing programs that could actually do things that computers couldn't do before, like play chess against people and actually win. This led to fear in society, which reflected in films like Stanley Kubrick's iconic 1968 sci-fi 2001 A Space Odyssey. In this film, the artificial intelligence program HAL 9000 actually plays chess against one of the human characters and wins. I'm sorry, Frank, I think you missed it. Queen to bishop three, bishop takes queen, knight takes bishop, mate. Later in the film, we see this same AI program turn on its human masters and actually decide to preserve itself at the expense of the lives of the humans. Hello, Hal, do you read me? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Do you read me, Hal? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. But then over a decade later, people's attitudes started to change again and our values towards technology became positive again because we had the invention of the home computer actually be accessible and usable in people's houses. So the media texts of the time also provided a more positive outlook on technology. And then almost 30 years after Stanley Kubrick predicted it, a computer called Deep Blue actually beat a chess master and became the best chess player on the planet. And so as a result of this, films were released that actually depicted artificial intelligence once again in a negative light. And then another 10 years pass, and this thing's invented, the iPhone, which led to more discussion about technology and artificial intelligence. And we can see within a year after the iPhone is released, Disney releases the film WALL-E. And in this film, we saw the value that technology is a threat, not in terms of artificial intelligence that wanted to kill everybody, but in terms of humans becoming a slave to their newfound screens and not enjoying the world around them. Oh yeah, and there was the artificial intelligence that wanted to kill everybody. I don't want to survive! I want to live! Must follow my directive. Ah! Look familiar? Luckily these are just movies and there is no real threat of AI enslaving the human race. Hey Siri, open the pod bay doors. Sorry, Charlie, I don't do pod bay doors. What this example shows us is that values within the one culture can actually change over time. And that these changes don't always occur in a neat straight line. That society's values can actually bounce back and forth depending on what is actually happening at the time. It also shows us that real world events have a big influence on the values of society and also that society's values have an influence on real world events. Which neatly brings us to our third key term, social issues. Key term number three. For us, a social issue is a concrete expression of a discourse or a social value. It can be linked to a specific time and place. 
So while a discourse is an abstract concept, and a social value underpins our opinions and our actions, there are things that cannot be seen. Social issues, on the other hand, can be seen. We can actually find it and point to it and say, yep, that's a social issue. It must show us these values and discourses. So while society's values evolve and change over time, so do social issues that might pop up and then disappear as time goes on. Social issues are things that people can actually pour their values into. A good analogy to look at the relationship between discourse, values and social issues could be when we look at the plant. When we see a plant grow, we only see the very top of it. This to us is like a media text or a social issue. We can actually see it and then we can make educated assumptions about the values that run beneath them. Our social values are like the seeds or the roots. We don't see them, they're beneath the surface and yet they're the thing that feeds the plant and makes it grow. Finally, the discourse is the garden or the soil. It's what everything rests on and yet it doesn't necessarily change over time. A garden remains a garden no matter whether you plant vegetables, cacti or any other plant in it. The garden stays the same just like discourse stays the same. We can also look at this relationship between discourse, social values and social issues like a pyramid. Discourse remains at the bottom. It is the foundation that everything else is framed upon. So for an example, it might be something like the discourse of gender. On top of that, we have our social values. These are the things that are actually our core beliefs that you might not see, but still hold up the issues on top of it. So in the discourse of gender, a value might be that women are equal to men. Finally, the issues are the things right at the very top that we can actually see and point at in this pyramid. So in our discourse here, the value that women are equal to men might result in the issue of equal prize money in tennis. So there you have a brief overview of some of the key terms to do with this area of study of media techs and society's values. If you'd like to learn more about some of these terms and find other examples, uh, in the description below, there are page numbers in the available textbooks. Please also feel free to comment below if you have any questions and hit the like and subscribe button if you'd like to see more of these kinds of videos. But until then, thanks for watching.